Chapter 3, Part 2, The War in Heaven, The Corruption of Utopia, and the Mall Deck, Mars War By Seth Lyon In order to understand the war in heaven we first have to establish both what is meant by heaven, and who, and what the principal players actually were. In popular mythology heaven is often envisioned as a place of billowy white clouds, and streaming sunlight, and sure, it could look like that, if the inhabitants desired, in fact it could look like anything. Heaven simply means the sixth, and seventh densities. The inhabitants of these realms are The divine archetypes, simplified by many with the term God, divinity actually exists as four distinct yet inextricably bound forces, the masculine and feminine principles, heart, Christ, energy, and body. The Archangels, and Angels, these are immortal manifestations of the Divine. Eternal beings of light with vast intelligence, and power. The Ascended Masters, incarnates who have ascended to the sixth density, and act as great guides, and teachers for all creation. Lucifer was the brightest of the Archangels, but he had a huge chip on his shoulder, if you want to know why. Read the Lucifer Appendix. He wasn't on board with the idea of everything moving towards unity, and oneness which is the plan of divinity, and overall destiny of the multiverse, because he feared that this would lead to no individuality, he didn't understand that he could be one with everything, and also retain his uniqueness, and I'm pretty sure that this is also due to the wound at the center of his creation. Again, see the Lucifer Appendix. What he actually feared was becoming one with his creator, because it would mean having to resolve his core trauma, something that's scary for anyone. To be fair, Divinity didn't understand at this point the responsibility it had in forming this trauma in the first place. 4.5 million years ago, this conflict reached ahead, and erupted into the war in heaven, with Lucifer and the host of angels he had managed to persuade, about one third of them, on one side, and Archangel Michael leading the rest of the heavenly forces against him. The mother, and father didn't take sides, because one of the fundamental tenets of this creation is that free will, and its resulting consequences must be allowed to play out, no matter how disastrous they may seem at the time. Long story short, Lucifer lost. He, and all those who, had sided with him were kicked out of heaven, meaning that Michael essentially lassoed the light bodies of the rebels, and beamed them down through the densities, through space, and time, to our solar system. It was thought that these fallen angels could learn some valuable lessons from the limitations, and solidity of fifth density reality, so the energy beam that carried them here contained coding written to bind the rebels to the fifth density. It worked with the angels. They were locked into the fifth density as monstrous, rocky creatures. But Lucifer was an archangel, possessing more energy than the lesser angels. He was able to take strength from the earth, and form a shield that broke, and deflected the beam. He was able to deflect enough coding that he retained some of his psychic, and interdensity abilities, and he was able to manifest a body for himself incarnate into a body, or to simply exist as conscious energy. He has, since incarnated many, many times, as a member of the Anunnaki, as a player in the thirteen royal bloodlines, and as a human, and through his myriad trials, and lessons he has, since been redeemed, and exists now as a great archangel of unconditional love, a rescuer, and redeemer of those unjustly banished to hell. This is kind of ironic as so many people who, worship Lucifer as a dark god are totally unaware that he is no longer that, and that the entity they are actually giving their energy to is, Araman, and his demon gods such as Baal, Baphomet, and Moloch. But at the time, when Lucifer, and his followers were banished to our system, the effect of that huge bundle of archetypal energy having its density greatly lowered as it passed through our solar system was much like the effect of cornstarch in gravy, 
our little region of space-time began to thicken. This paved the way for the demonic energy of Araman, and his, Azuras, to penetrate our little corner of the multiverse more intensely with their vibration. Utopia, our lovely Earth, and her surrounding community of peaceful planets, began its long, slow descent into corruption, and darkness, a low point that we are just starting to climb our way out of today. 4.5 to 2.5 million years ago, over the course of these three million years the vibration of our solar system gradually slowed, and Utopia slowly sickened, and so it was during this time that a group who, had a big grudge against the two most densely populated planets in our system, Maldek, and Mars, saw their opportunity to return. 2.5 million years ago, the group of 13 royal bloodlines from Orion, the souls that were previously kicked out of our system for being too dark, and violent during the time of Utopia, settled on Maldek, and began to influence, and quicken the decline of that planet's consciousness grid. That planet's people, who were already on a downward slide, and many of whom were from the defeated reptoid lineage who, had fled there from Earth long ago, were easily seduced by the dark men from Orion and quickly embraced their ideals of service to self, technology, and control, giving up their freedom in attempt to gain some sense of power over their deteriorating circumstances, but the yearning for that type of power, and control is a vicious cycle that only leads to wanting more. They started to become belligerent, and then downright threatening towards their peaceful Martian neighbors eventually insisting that Mars surrender its territory to Maldekian control voluntarily, or they would be conquered, colonized, and possibly wiped out. Some of the citizens of Mars appealed to their relatives in the Pleiades for aid, and the Pleiadians answered by sending a fleet of ships to help out. Ironically, Maldek took the arrival of the Pleiadian fleet as a provocation, and used it to justify their attack on Mars. Using electromagnetic gravitic technology, essentially a tech-generated Merkaba field, the Maldekians created an energy grid, around their planet that could be used as both a shield, and as a weapon against the Martians natural, created solely with group consciousness, Merkaba shield. By using this weapon Maldek was able to disrupt the Martian energy grid enough to bombard the planet with poisonous chemical bombs, causing chain reactions in the atmosphere that turned the air into a toxic fume. This happened very rapidly, and most of the Martians died before they knew what hit them. Many of these souls returned to Sirius, and the Pleiades, while others who were too traumatized to access that vibration hovered around Earth, waiting to incarnate. The most evolved Martians, a group made up mostly of those original souls who, had settled on Mars during the Orion Wars, were able to escape in their light bodies. In retaliation, the Pleiadian fleet surrounded Maldek, and bombarded it with energy beams that began to destabilize the Maldek energy shield. Panicking, the Orion leaders of Maldek cranked up the power of their grid in an attempt to take out the entire Pleiadian fleet in one big energy burst, but their plan backfired. Passing an increased current through the damaged tech-based energy field destabilized the natural electromagnetic gravitic grid of the planet so much that Maldek was shattered into bits, becoming the asteroid belt now located between Mars and Jupiter. The very souls of the deceased inhabitants of Maldek were shattered as well by the trauma of their entire planet being suddenly ripped apart. Each soul there was shredded into many soul fragments each still capable of consciousness, but with a fraction of the energy of their original selves. They flocked to Earth, now the safest, most hospitable planet in the system, and joined the souls of the Martians there, hovering around the planet in a great cloud of soul families, waiting to incarnate. Many of the people on Earth now were part of that group. Seconds before the planet was torn apart the group of 13 royal bloodlines who made up the leadership of the Orion faction, and who were well prepared for just such an eventuality, managed to escape into space-time using their electromagnetic gravitic technology. 
they traveled in three gigantic, disc-shaped motherships, battered, and damaged from the wars, to a place, and time where they saw that it would be both possible, and advantageous to manifest, to Atlantis, approximately 52,000 years before our present day. The Pleiadians though, saw what they were up to. They were too battered, and weary from the war though, and not able, or inclined to pursue them through space-time, so they came up with another solution. They imposed an artificial third density matrix onto the planet by setting up an advanced digital computer system, powered by 12 nuclear generators, in the spaceship we call the Moon, which projected a holographic, egg, shaped matrix around the Earth. This third density matrix, which we are still living in today, is a superimposed holographic overlay on 5D Earth, a lower frequency caricature of 5D reality. Now, you might be wondering how a holographic projection can keep anyone trapped, but, it is so, because these holograms are not just light. They are so powerful that they form an electromagnetic force field, the Van Allen belt. You cannot pass that force field without technology that can manipulate frequency, or by developing your consciousness enough that you can raise your physical vibration to match the 5D frequency. The Pleiadians looked down the timeline, and saw that this third density matrix would already be in place when the Orion group emerged from space-time in their damaged ships, which further damaged their equipment to the point that they lost the technology to manipulate frequency, and their consciousness was not sufficiently evolved to access that frequency without technological assistance, so therefore the Orion group would be trapped on third-density Earth, and would not be able to escape. That way, the Pleiadians figured, they could take their time to go home, recover, and check back on the situation later. This third density matrix also had the added benefit of more closely matching the frequency of the traumatized souls of Maldek, and Mars, who were hovering around Earth waiting to incarnate. The thirteen royal bloodlines from Orion have played a major role in our planet's history ever, since that time. They eventually joined with the Draco who, had been hibernating underground, and together, along with the Jesuits, also called the Illuminati, and a certain German political party they would meet much later on, they would form the core of the group that today we have come to call the Cabal. These dark men from Orion, these thirteen royal bloodlines all had elongated skulls, which you can see appear prominently in Egyptian and other post-flood cultures. This group, and their elongated skulls, can be traced to the Roman Empire, the Vatican, and European royalty, many of whom also had elongated skulls, though over time their skulls have gotten smaller as their physiology reacted, and adapted to the energy, gravity, and DNA, of the planet. The Pleiadians have, since regretted their part in the destruction of Maldek and have been trying to help us out, since then, resulting in the many present-day channelers who speak for different beings there, and the many star seeds from there, who choose to incarnate on Earth. They are also part of the efforts currently underway to move us out of the third density matrix, though most are not aware of the necessary role the third density plays in allowing us to interface with the mother wound, and that the process cannot be rushed for we must bring all those lost pieces of the mother with us into the fifth density in order for any evolution, or ascension process to integrate, and stick. For more about this read parts 1, and 2 of the preface, if you have not already. 2.5 million years ago, our neighborhood was in trouble, as the low vibe that now permeated our system made it more possible for nasty beings of all types to take up residence. The Earth had been designated a living library, home to flora, and fauna from across the galaxy, but that's not the only thing that makes her special, the spirit of the Earth is the largest, most sentient piece of the lost original mother. Because of this, our little blue planet is an energetic linchpin for all of creation, so there was very real reasons for concern among the higher forces of light. Sanat Kumara, 
the leader of 144,000 knockalls who were still in residence on 5th density Venus, decided it was time to return to Earth for a, well to help stabilize the situation. He traveled here with 400 of his people, and together they manifested a 5D city above the Gobi Sea, which is now the Gobi Desert. This city would become known as the White City, or Shambhala. Once Shambhala was established, the rest of the Nakals made the trip from Venus, and took up residency. Foreseeing that they would be involved with nurturing all forms of life on the planet for a long time to come, Sanat Kumara decided that a 4D city should be constructed underground, directly below Shambhala, so a portion of the Nakals manifested some 4D bodies so that they could interface with the fourth density reality on Earth and began construction of Lower Shambhala. The group of humans from the Pleiades who, had settled here about 17.5 million years before, and who were also living at the fourth density, most of Agartha is 4D territory, had already established a city underground, and they welcomed the Nakals, and also assisted with the construction. Then the Nakals began the real work. Together with the Pleiadian group, and the more highly evolved Martians who, had escaped the destruction of their planet's atmosphere in their light bodies, they began helping the traumatized souls of all those who, had perished in the mall deck, Marswar, who were hovering around the earth in a great cloud, waiting to incarnate here. These poor souls were so traumatized, and fragmented. They had lost all their psychic abilities, and Akashic memory, and were barely sentient. They incarnated into the third density matrix as primitive hominids, the genus we know as Homo habilis. The active DNA, was reduced to two strands, with the ten other strands existing only as potential. The different soul families, each of which was comprised of shards from a previously intact, single soul, incarnated into different tribes. Essentially. One tribe equals one soul family equals one shattered Maldikian, or Martian soul. To this day, many of the souls who inhabit the earth are from this group, and, while some have evolved, and healed over time, regaining much of their former spiritual prowess, others have not, and are still barely above their ancient hominid ancestors in terms of consciousness. The reason that our fossil record shows so many different species of the genus Homo subsequently appearing, and disappearing throughout the millions of years that follow this time is, because of both evolution, and continued genetic manipulation by the Nakals, as well as many other groups. In fact, descendants from these tribes would eventually be altered into Homo sapiens by the Immunaki about two million years after the introduction of Homo habilis.